two years, you've got massive numbers of scales. Um, and so from a tiny infestation, you can end up with a, with a huge infestation pretty quickly. The reason why I want to show you these uh, life cycle is to point out, um, you know, I, I mentioned the adult female. Um, she's under this protective covering. She lays her eggs under this protective covering. The only stage that you'll find that's really uh, not protected are, is the stage called the crawlers. And that's right after they hatch, um, they need to move to another location in order to find a new feeding grounds. Um, so they're very small. They usually only move a few centimeters away, um, but they can be carried by wind. Um, they can end up on the feet of other insects like potato leaf hoppers and kind of be carried to other plants. Uh, so, um, so that can, can move them around and cause additional problems. Uh, there is a male stage that, is, uh, that flies around to mate with the sedentary females. Um, we've never really tried to target that stage. Uh, they're very short-lived, um, and uh, but they may provide another window for some management options in the future. So the only thing I really want you to take away from this, uh, two things. One, uh, focus on that blue line if you can. It's the one with the really sharp point right after May. Um, so what this, this is showing, we took a, a, a look at some trees over the course of an entire year to try to figure out when these insects are the most active. Um, and when that crawler stage that is uh, the least protected is actually most present so that we could uh, figure out when to target applications of, of pesticides to them. And so those crawlers um, start to become active and have a really huge um, peak of emergence, usually around the second week of May um, is when they start and then through uh, June is when they're peaking. They, they then kind of, you know, go into their next stage, the population turns into young and then adults again, and then in August you'll have a second peak. Um, but you'll notice that second peak is a lot broader, there's a wider span of time. And so there's, there really is never any time that we see zero crawlers. There's always a couple of them around, which means that there is an activity window for this insect of about 24 weeks over the course of the, uh, the year. Um, but these two peaks in, in May, June, and in August are really where you're going to um, focus your targeting if you're targeting the crawler stage of this insect. Um, again, just to reiterate, uh, the crawler stage is the only mobile stage and most susceptible. Um, if you're going to target any of these other stages, the adult stage or any of the immatures that are underneath the wax covering, you have to disrupt and break apart that wax covering. Um, and if you do that, those insects are actually pretty vulnerable. Um, to both pesticides and to drying out in the air because they're not used to being just uh, exposed like that. So um, we're going to talk about other times to target the insect and, and how we can do that to, to help increase your, your management options. Um, the thing that I, I try to reiterate to people both who are doing landscape um, and nursery production is that unfortunately this insect is everywhere, it's in the woods um, surrounding your farm, it's, it comes in on a neighbor's uh, landscape. So if you're managing a property and the neighboring property is not managing for this scale, um, it can blow over into your, your property. Uh, even if you've, you feel like you've cleaned up the mess and it's gone, it can always come back. So it's something to, um, to kind of have on your scouting list. Uh, another unfortunate aspect of this uh, insect is that it has a very wide host range. Um, now we almost always see it on maples um, and uh, we see it on holly a lot, it becomes a problem. Uh, but in general, it, it has a very wide range of plants, both trees and shrubs that it will attack. 
um, and it may have preferences. So it may not prefer certain species. So you might have a couple of the, the same or different um, uh, plants in an area and really just find the, the um, pest is, is focused on one plant uh, or one plant type. And that's normal because they don't have a, um, uh, they seem to have a strong preference, like we said, for, for maples um, and, and apples and, and cherries. But they can end up on these other plants as well. So it's always good to take a look around. If you find an infestation, take a look at some of the neighboring trees and shrubs and make sure that they're okay too. Scouting for these uh, insects, again, part of the problem with, uh, with these insects in general is that when the population is small, uh, it's easy to miss because the individual insects are so small and they can tend to blend into the bark um, and in the crevices of the bark. So I'll talk a little bit about scouting for adults and then we really uh, use some monitoring techniques for crawlers in order to see when they are becoming active so that we can target our, our applications uh, when crawlers are becoming active. Um, for scouting for adults, um, in Tennessee, you can, you can scout any time of the year that you have the ability to, to scout. Um, my suggestion is to start looking in February and to really, really try your best to get out there and look in February. And the reason for this is, um, you know, we've had all these people come to us and say, uh, you know, there were no scales in the fall, my, my trees were clean, and then they were everywhere in the spring. And the reason for that and what happens is uh, the immature scales have sort of a brownish uh, scale cover. It's, it very much blends into the tree trunk. I mean, I've literally been out there on plants that I infested and I know there are scales on there with a hand lens and I couldn't find them in the fall. Um, and then what happens is over the course of the, the next couple months, by the end of January, those scales are molting to their adult stage. And the adult female in particular is the one that has that white waxy scale uh, covering. So all of a sudden you go from a tree that looks okay to a tree that's speckled with white. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to see. Um, and so all of a sudden your eye will catch that there's something wrong with this tree, even though you look, might have looked at it a month or two earlier and it was fine. Um, so that's really the month to target. In addition, since this pest really does have um, caused some major problems on uh, deciduous trees that drop their leaves, again, you're not going to have that foliage blocking your view. So this is a good time to look. Um, the other bonus for, for um, finding out you have a problem in February is that you can plan your treatments for the rest of the year and you're not playing catch up um, once the populations are really getting going. Um, and yeah, so that's pretty much my, my advice for, um, for scouting for adults. Um, again, looking for the white scale covers. If you, if you do have a, trees that are flushed out, focus on the base of the trees and the main trunk and crooks of branches. Um, again, the, the scales do tend to blow around and fall. And so you'll often find infestations kind of starting at the base of the trees where maybe they got blown out of the canopy, but they were able to crawl to the base of the tree and establish there. Um, if you are in nursery, obviously you've got so many trees and so many acres you know, what are you going to do? Um, focus on your high value plants, your susceptible plants. Um, and if you've got an area that you've had problems before, um, a physical area of your farm, uh, and you think it might be coming in from the edge of the forest, uh, one, try not to plant susceptible plants there. But if you, if you end up having plants in those areas again, um, spend a little more time focusing on those areas to make sure it's not something that's coming in from the, the forest edge. 
Um, and then, you know, your optimal thing is if you've got plants that you think um, are, you're planning to sell in December, it's a good idea to scout them in February of the year before if you think that certain plants you've already sold or you know they're going to be out the door, um, check them in, in the spring um, so you know you have time to clean them up before you dig them. And again, I already went through this. Uh, and then the final um, thing to, to be aware of is inspecting new cuttings and liners that you receive. Um, new plants uh, for landscapers. I mean, I've been in Lowe's and seen Japanese maple scale on plants. Um, so customers and homeowners are bringing them in. You know, they're, they're everywhere and it's in a lot of cases and we can, we can hope and infer, but also know that, you know, it's not malicious on people's parts. It, they are difficult to see. So you may catch something that an inspector maybe didn't catch um, and so bring your liners in, uh, your new plants in, scout them before you put them out um, is a good practice. And that way, you know, uh, if you do have a problem, you know, you can either uh, not accept those plants or uh, treat them before you start putting them out with your other, your other plants. To monitor for crawlers, this is kind of after you know you have an infestation, but you want to target your, um, your insecticide sprays if you're going to target the crawlers. Um, you can just put double-sided tape or something on a branch near an infestation, apply a little bit of um, Vaseline or uh, petroleum jelly on that strip. Uh, you don't need a lot. It's just to catch them as they're crawling across the strip. Um, and since they're purple, they're very tiny, um, but they're purple. So you're not gonna mistake them for anything else when you see them. Um, and all you need is a hand lens. And what you'll find is that they'll kind of bunch up on the edge of the, the Vaseline and get stuck. And so um, that's a good way to kind of see, okay, the population is starting to get active. I need to apply my, my treatments now. And uh, for those of you who use degree day calendars, um, these guys are very uh, consistent year to year in their activity period. And um, unfortunately, because especially here in Tennessee, we have such odd uh, springs in recent years. Um, sometimes it's hotter earlier, sometimes it's hotter later. Um, it's really better than looking at a calendar date. Um, it is better to track uh, degree days because uh, that window might move quite a bit in, in spring here in Tennessee. Um, so 800 growing degree days is the very earliest we have ever seen um, scale crawlers. Uh, usually around 1,000 growing degree days is when they're peaking in the spring. And again, in, in August, you're, you're targeting around 2,400 growing degree days is when you're gonna see those, those crawlers start coming out and peaking again. But the months are, are a good target, and um, if you're going to use crawler strips and the, the degree days, if you if you use those. Okay, so now I'm going to go through basically the whole year and tell you what to apply when, because um, really that's uh, the most useful, I think, uh, for for most people. So from January to April here. Um, often you can use a, a dormant oil spray. Um, again, you know, if you're in landscape and you've got huge plants, just wait a second, we'll get there. Um, if you're in nursery, this is a good practice. Um, you can knock out a lot of overwintering problems, especially mite eggs and things like that uh, with uh, dormant sprays. Again, uh, the, the horticultural oils that exist today are different than they existed you know, 30, 40 years ago. So if you have in mind those old fashioned oils that were really heavy and caused a lot of phyto, um, the newer oils are a lot better. Um, they're refined and so they're, they're less likely to cause those types of problems. Um, but again, if you're concerned about a particular plant, always do a test run on a couple uh, before you go out and spray an entire field. We've seen 75% reduction in live scales uh, with 
the horticultural oil, and that is purely mechanical. It's because uh, the oil dissolves the wax. If you ever remember from school, life, like dissolves like. Um, you can't mix oil and water, but you can mix oil and oil. Uh, so the, the oil uh, actually does um, help dissolve the waxy armor of the insects, and so it exposes them to uh, the air. And in the winter, the air is drier, and they basically just dry out. Uh, so it's a good way to get your population knocked back um, prior to the start of the season. Um, the other key thing that the horticultural oil does is those wax covers are very uh, resilient. They take a long time to fall off. So even if you've killed every single insect on that plant, um, the scale covers often stick around and leave residue for quite a while. And you know, I don't know about you, but if I'm in a store or I'm you know, making selections to purchase plants and I see scale covers on something, um, I'm not gonna buy it. And, um, and you can probably bet that your, uh, the people you're selling plants to, uh, they're not gonna take your word for it, that those scales are dead. Um, they're gonna see the residue and they're gonna not wanna buy them. So um, the, the horticultural oil helps those scale covers flake off because it helps dissolve them. Now this is a new um, recommendation that we have after a couple years of trials um, where we found that um, people were asking us if they could ap apply uh, growth regulators with their dormant oil. So traditionally uh, we apply pyroproxifen and other growth regulators uh, to the crawler stage. Um, that's what, what the normal targeting is. However, um, some growth regulators with some insects actually prevent egg hatch and can prevent females from developing eggs. And so we did a few years of testing to see if that was the case for um, Japanese maple scale. And the good news is that yes, it is, it, it does work. So um, instead of spacing out your applications and doing a, you know, a dormant oil application and then doing uh, a later uh, application to crawlers, you can mix the two and it works very well. Um, the time period that we have targeted for applying this, uh, this treatment is March to April. This is basically when the females are out, um, they've started mating and they're developing their eggs. Um, if you wait too long, uh, you're into the crawler stage where the crawlers become active any earlier, the females may not be um, out of dormancy yet. So, um, but this gives you essentially a two month window um, to get this application out. The benefit of this application in addition is that you can use a higher rate of horticultural oil. I mean, we've used 3% on maples that are just starting to flush in at the end of April and we've had no problems with damage. Um, but since the leaves of a lot of these plants have not flush, flushed out uh, completely, you get better coverage. Um, since these are bark feeding insects, you know, your, your biggest challenge is getting the product to hit the insect. And so this is a good time to, um, to, to focus on this treatment. If you've got very, very large plants, or if you're talking about um, nursery scale, uh, another option that does work, although I'll, with some caveats, and I'll, I'll explain them in a second, um, is systemic uh, neonicotinoid drenches. Uh, imidacloprid specifically, um, dinotefrin or safari also works, um, but in a shorter window. So what we found with these products is that if you use them in a midocloprid drench, um, it does prevent crawler establishment. So we've had a lot of anecdotal uh, comments from growers in particular who are using this treatment for flathead borer, and they said, well, we don't have scale um, on those plants. And so traditionally, uh, imidacloprid really usually isn't a very good treatment for armored scales, but for this armored scale, it, it does appear to prevent establishment. 
Um, it can also clean some trees up that have an infestation, except it will take quite a while. Um, and what we found is if we applied a, a, an a application in March or April um, to a, a heavily infested plant, by the end of summer, by that second generation, you've, you've got lots of decrease in live scale, but there's still some. Um, and then over winter to the next season, by the next season, uh, we couldn't find any scale on those plants. And we're not sure whether that's because it takes that long for the imidacloprid to get in there, um, or if one of the breakdown products of imidacloprid might be more toxic to the, um, to the scale. There, there are, once the imidacloprid's in the plant, it breaks down into other uh, compounds, and it's possible that it takes a while for that to happen. Um, and that's why it takes a while for the scale to, um, to population to, to decrease. Um, you can, again, put some uh, uh, summer oil applications on there to help uh, get the, um, the scale covers to flake off faster, but summer oil really isn't strong enough to, to do a, a good job of killing uh, the scales at this time. And, um, like I said, you can use dinutefrin on a, uh, a small uh, infestation, but we really haven't seen it last to the second generation. So if there's any scales uh, that you missed or if they blow in from another plant during that August peak, um, the, the compound's already gone and there's really no protection for, against that second generation. Um, and spray applications do not work. Um, again, I mentioned this, um, it only lasts one generation. So um, we haven't seen it protect uh, very large trees in August. It might work better in some smaller trees um, or shrubs, uh, but we also have not seen dinotefrin be very effective as a spray. So if you do want to target the crawlers, again, this, this gives you an option where um, now we're at essentially a third application if you have a very bad infestation and you did a dormant oil application, maybe you did the dormant oil plus pyroproxifen. Um, you can also attack these um, and target these crawler uh, populations as well. Um, again, the, the, the first peak in May, mid-June and in August. Um, now, the, the biggest challenge with these applications is coverage. Um, this is when your, your plants are, are, you know, growing and there's lots of foliage. Uh, you can hit the trunks pretty well, but within the canopy, um, you're always going to have, you know, some issues. So if you are spraying at this time, you want to make sure your tractor's going slow. Um, if you have a small area that's being, uh, that's problematic, uh, you know, using a backpack sprayer and getting really in there, um, putting some uh, uh, water cards inside your canopies just to see if you're actually getting penetration. Uh, this is why uh, this early application that I've recommended is, is really your better bet. Um, I am fully aware that that is the worst time of the year to recommend uh, you spend time doing that because of uh, shipping and digging for nursery. Um, but unfortunately, the insect doesn't give us uh, a better option. So, um, but these are also times where you can be knocking back that population. You can apply your imidacloprid drench in the early fall uh, for the following spring. Um, you wanna, again, when I say fall, early fall, when the plants are still have leaves on them, they're still transpiring, they're pulling up um, product from the ground. If you've got containers, this is a good time to get that uh, product in the containers, um, get it into the plant, but also have it in the, um, in the soil to plant out. If you're gonna plant those uh, trees out for the next uh, spring, we have seen that that, uh, that technique does work as well um, by pre-treating your containers prior to uh, transplant. And again, um, don't forget that you can actually do dormant oil sprays in uh, the late fall and early winter. 
Um, this is actually, in my opinion, even potentially a better time uh, than doing the dormant oil in the, the late winter um, because they've got that whole winter uh, to survive or not survive. So um, you're exposing those scales to a cold, dry air for months. And so the likelihood of them surviving that after a, an oil application with good coverage is um, diminishes. So just to kind of um, cover uh, what a management plan might look like for these, again, if you're bringing material in, inspect it, treat it uh, with dormant oil as a preventative if, if uh, you're not sure if you've got some scales on there, if you can. Um, if you've got plants in the, that you're planning to, to sell or dig in the fall, it's good to try to target one growing season ahead for scouting at least. Um, and again, this is because it gives you that window to do multiple applications if you have to um, and get those scale covers uh, off of that plant so that when people, when inspectors look at it or when buyers look at it, um, they're not gonna have a question about whether they should purchase your product. Um, if you can have trained workers assigned to scout for JMS who know what they're looking for. I mean, it's one thing to send, you know, new people out to look, but JMS is really hard to see, even for me who works on them uh, and for people who, who are looking all the time. So sending people who don't really know what they're looking for to scout is not a good idea. Um, and again, you know, we make time for what we think is important. So I realize uh, time and labor are uh, at a premium in the spring, um, but if you just have that on your, your schedule that you're going to be doing these things and having someone who you trust, who knows what they're doing, assigned to uh, scout and treat so that you don't end up with a disaster uh, down the road. So um, some summary, Plant clean material, scout in February, apply dormant oil, apply those growth regulator combinations, um, use a systemic, um, if it's a, a large plant or uh, if it's hard to, to get those sprays in there like uh, hollies. Um, and you should be able to protect those trees for probably the first two years after that application. Uh, there is an extension publication with a lot of this information out there, and um, I don't know, Amy, if you can maybe put that link in the chat area so that people can download it directly right now if they want it. Um, I will make these slides available that Amy can send out later. Um, so before we move on to Flathead Board, does anyone have... Um, questions that they would like to have answered. I don't know if I can see the chat. chat. You are, let's see. Um, we do have one question. Uh, does Japanese maple scale target both healthy and unhealthy trees in the land? So um, I have not noticed a difference. We have not specifically tried to stress trees to see if the stressed ones are more likely to, to get establishment than others. I can tell you that we have intentionally infested plants that were very lovingly taken care of at the nursery center here. And uh -huh. they all got scalp. So um, I think even if you are, um, you know, careful and, and um, really caring for your plants, they can still get in there. Um, over fertilizing is, is probably one of those things that you want to avoid for a number of reasons. Um, and, uh, but the, I'm trying to remember what rates, I mean, we, for certain plants, we're using, you know, the recommended horticultural rates of fertilization. So I don't think over fertilization um, caused any problems, but I can't say that it won't if, um, if you have a, a field of plants 
Um, any of them that are a little bit uh, unhappy um, are going to be easier for those insects to overcome. Any other questions? Okay, I was going to say, I think you pretty much answered his second question as well. Can you see the chat? Yeah, I opened the chat. Okay, great. Unfortunately, when I'm sharing my screen, I can't, I can't, uh, or sharing the full screen, I can't see the chat. So, um, please explain okay. about Merit may work with hard scale. So Merit is imidacloprid. Um, and again, uh, when people started coming to us saying that they don't have scale when they use imidacloprid, I really, I, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I didn't believe them. Um, I thought it was just probably a coincidence and people were, you know, um, maybe it just so happened that they used that product and they didn't have scale. Um, but we actually did a test where we hand infected plants that we treated with uh, discus as a drench <clears throat> and um, where we challenged them and we put a lot of scale on those plants and there was nothing after a, a drench treatment, which again is very puzzling um, because the standard recommendation for years has been that um, armored scales are not really susceptible to imidacloprid. Um, but for some reason this one is. And I mean, they're different species. They have different mutations. I mean, there's, there's something about this scale that it doesn't like imidacloprid. Um, now, it, it did take a very long time for the established populations to die. Um, so, like I said, it may not be the imidacloprid. Um, it could be one of the breakdown products uh, that is more toxic to the scales. And that's actually been seen in hemlock woolly adelgid, on adelgids. Uh, in hemlock, they treat with imidacloprid, but it's really one of the breakdown products that is like, I think, 10 times more toxic to the, the um, adelgid than the imidacloprid. So it could be something like that. Um, we, we really don't know. But I, this is not a blanket recommendation for all hard scales to use that treatment. This is for if you have Japanese maple scale, because I cannot guarantee that it would work for any other armored scale. Any other questions, guys? We can move on to everybody's second favorite pest. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Let me full screen this. Okay. Um, I want to thank my student for getting this awesome picture of a flathead borer. Um, so this is everyone's other favorite uh, nursery and landscape pest. Um, and so to, to kind of give you some big picture facts about flathead borer. There are actually many species of this uh, closely related insect um, and they're not, they're native to North America. They did not come in on a boat um, <laughs> from somewhere else. They're native to the area. Um, there are some species that have a uh, preferred hosts. So the, the species we talk about a lot, um, and that is in the literature and in the extension information a lot, is flat-headed apple tree borer. And that's the one I circled there in uh, red. Um, but if you can tell all those guys apart on the right-hand side, uh, you know, it, it actually takes a lot of effort to, to differentiate between its relatives and uh, that one. And they all have slightly different um, host ranges, but the ones that we deal with here are, um, again, huge fans of maple um, and apples. It was named after, it's called the flat-headed apple tree borer because that was the first host it was ever identified in. Um, and other sort of, uh, basically any deciduous tree that we kind of like to have in our landscape. So um, different levels of preference. 
and um, but there's still a lot of confusion as to what exact species they are. But the good news is is that their behaviors are pretty similar. Uh, the recommendations are fairly similar, so um, it, you don't really need to know exactly what species it is that you have. But um, if you're curious and you're not sure if you have this pest, uh, you can, um, I'll show you a few ways to kind of uh, confirm your suspicions. Um, a couple of things about this uh, borer is that they prefer to lay eggs within the first foot of the tree at the base. Um, and they're trying to target weaknesses in that bark. So any trunk damage that may have happened from mowing or um, uh, poor planting technique, uh, planting too low, uh, and graft unions if you've got a, a plant that has a, a different rootstock. So those areas. Um, and they prefer to lay on the sunny side of the tree because, again, insects are cold-blooded um, and so they need that heat. So uh, the females tend to lay their eggs and the larval damage tends to be on the southwest side, which can get confusing because there are other problems you might see on the southwest side of plants. Um, so just to give you an idea of what, uh, what we're looking for, the adults you will probably never see. Um, unless you're really lucky or you're looking for them specifically. It's the larval stage um, that is in the tree causing the damage. And uh, they're called flat-headed borers because they have this kind of flat uh, front end um, that is very distinctive. So if you find a, a bark that's flaking off and you dig around in there and you find one of these, uh, you've definitely got a flat-headed borer and you may have one of the uh, ones we're uh, interested in right here. Now scouting uh, for flat-headed borer, I mean, I think most of you probably know that by the time you have this pest, it's already too late. Um, so the purpose of scouting for this in a, a nursery setting is to know that you have a population active in the area so you can do something about it the next season. Um, in landscape, again, it's kind of a, oops, it already happened. Um, but if you have a property that you consistently see trees dying because of this issue, um, you can take some preventative measures in order to make sure that the new plants you replace them with uh, are going to establish and, and kind of outcompete these, these borers. So what you're looking for for damage, you're looking for sunken and cracked uh, bark, usually on the south side of the plant. Um, it's going to look different than freeze damage. You know, freeze damage usually has a split, um, but it will not have what that second, first and second image, those arrows are pointing to are actually the, um, it kind of looks like sawdust. It's the larval uh, excrement. So their, um, their frass is basically like a sawdust cake that they leave behind them as they move around. So that'll flake out. If you, if you take a knife and you pull away the bark, it'll just crumble like, you know, basically the inside of, of the, the bark has been turned to sawdust. So you're looking for that. That's not going to be present in a situation where you have freeze damage or, or other kind of um, a, uh, uh, environmental uh, damage. What you might also see is suckering at the base of the tree um, and in severe cases, especially when we're talking about uh, newly transplanted nursery or in um, cases of uh, plants and landscape, you're going to see the dieback and um, you can get complete girdling of the tree and you know that tree is not going to survive. Uh, or it's going to be uh, really compromised in the future. So as I mentioned, um, flat-headed borers, there are many different species, but the ones we're talking about here in Tennessee that we have problems with um, will hit maple, apple, dogwood, oak are, you know, the big uh, problem trees. Um, we do find that faster growing cultivars appear to be more resistant than slower. 
uh, cultivars. This is like within the same group. So if you're talking about red maples, um, autumn blaze, which is a hybrid that fast growing, that tree seems to be uh, more resistant than, than some of its slower growing counterparts. Um, you know, you want to look out for those wounds at the base of trees. Um, and again, the, like many other situations, the first year after transplant is when these plants are the most vulnerable. Um, flathead borers will continue to attack trees in nurseries or, or landscape later on um, if there is a, a, a susceptible tree. But that first year after transplant, when those trees are really trying to get established, is when they're the weakest and uh, we see the most damage in the field. Um, there are three uh, control methods that um, uh, you can use at, right now that are available. Uh, the first is simply cultural, uh, making sure that you are selecting plants that grow well here, um, especially in landscape situations. I know, you know, in certain cities, we've got a lot of people moving from different areas of the country, and they're like, I want this plant, or they have preferences, um, but it's best to <laughs> try to offer people things that uh, work better in Tennessee, um, and making sure that planting technique is uh, correct and appropriate for those plants. Um, planting too deep, um, we see it time and time again, causes lots of different types of problems, but um, it can also cause stress on that tree and make it more susceptible uh, to being having trunk attacks. Um, Imidacloprid is uh, the standard recommendation for these. Uh, it has been for the past couple years. Um, Dr. Jason Oliver has done a lot of work. Uh, the two of us just completed a, another four-year project. I'll show you some of that. Um, the systemic drenches will give you three years of protection. Um, and in particular, if you apply them early enough in the first year, um, you can head off so much damage um, from uh, this borer. If you can get them to establish in the ground um, before those uh, borers um, can come in. You, there are also um, uh, recommendations for trunk sprays with contact pesticides. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about a project we're going to be doing over the next four years. Um, we've not had consistent control with trunk sprays and part of the reason is just a lack of information about when those beetles are laying their eggs. So if you imagine, you know, the female is landing on the, at the trunk of the tree, she's laying an egg in a crevice, or maybe, you know, somebody weed whacked at the base of that tree and there's a little damage. Um, she lays an egg, the egg hatches and it burrows straight into the tree. So where did that, in, that little larva contact uh, insecticide? It, it probably didn't. It probably just burrowed right in. Um, so contact sprays, we're going to be working on some trials with new products and with old products to try to really narrow down when that window is because uh, we do realize that trunk sprays um, are going to be a little bit more uh, practical in, uh, in some situations. So, um, so we'll be working on that, but as of right now, um, we can give you some recommendations, but we can't guarantee that, that you'll be successful. There is a topic that I wanted to bring up, and this is um, more for the landscape crowd uh, than for nursery. Um, there is a, a lab in North Carolina, um, urban forestry, that they've been working on trying to figure out um, what is a, an appropriate landscape to plant, specifically red maples, but they're looking at um, different uh, different types of uh, plants as well. And um, the, uh, the, the idea and the reason behind this was because I think the city of Raleigh was losing hundreds and hundreds of red maples every year um, that they were planting and they were dying. Um, and so this is a technique that they developed in order to kind of figure out 
um, what percent of the area around a planting is impervious surface, which means, you know, parking lot and sidewalk and, and you know, building versus actual soil for the plant to live in. And, um, and they did this technique across the city to try to figure out which plants were successful. And um, so I wanna show this to you so that it, it can kind of um, spark in your mind if, if you are working in these types of areas where you're, you're choosing plants for landscapes that are maybe, you know, Walmart parking lots, uh, you can have an idea of why those trees keep dying. So um, this, these are slides from uh, Frank, uh, Stephen Frank, not Frank Hale. Um, looking at good, fair, and poor sites for red maples. And basically over the course of many years, they found that if up to 35% of the area around the tree is sidewalk or, or parking lot, the tree would do great. It was, it was perfectly fine. Um, if you started getting more and more of this sidewalk and parking lot um, up to 63%, the tree would be okay, but it wouldn't look great. I mean, that doesn't look like a great tree to me. Um, and then 64 to 100% impervious surface, which is like really just like a tree right next to a building, right next to a parking lot. Um, those trees tended to get scale insects, all sorts of pests, and not survive very well or they would start looking like you wanted to remove them from the landscape. Um, they came up with sort of an average over time uh, to try to figure out throughout the southeast. So this, these are averages across the southeast um, for red maples in different cities. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't do uh, Nashville or Murfreesboro to, to give us an idea, but they do have Knoxville on there. Um, but on average, they found for red maples up to 35% uh, impervious surface across the southeast was pretty good for, for red maples. Um, and so I want to explain to you how they do this, because when I first heard about this, I thought this was cool, but I was like, well, how do you calculate the air, you know, the area around a tree if you're just out there. Um, and so what they did, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show some pictures of this too, but um, they basically, if you stand by a tree in a parking lot or wherever you're, you're planning to plant, um, you take 25 steps out from the planting site at a 45 degree angle to the closest impervious surface, which would be maybe a parking lot. Um, and you count the number of steps that you step on an impervious surface. So if you walk a little while on grass and then end up on the parking lot, you, you count the number of steps on the parking lot. Then you turn 90 degrees and do it again from the center, turn another 90 degrees, turn another 90 degrees. Um, and so what you're doing is creating an X. Um, and this is just a, a image example of, say you're standing at that dot, you're going to take steps out and you're going to count and if you end up at a building you just assume that the rest of those steps are impervious um and then you add them all together so you've taken 100 steps um and if 66 of those steps were on asphalt um you would say that that tree is going to experience 66% impervious surface. And if it's a red maple, that kind of falls way outside of the happy zone. Um, so this is a, met, like, a pretty simple, straightforward method um, to determining whether you want to plant a tree there. Now, um, as I've mentioned, They've only done this with red maples. There are some people who are using this technique to try to figure out other plants. Um, I can give you the links to this, uh, this data sheet of how to do this technique. Um, my recommendation is if, if you have a sense that you've got certain plants that are hardier and do better than red maple, um, you, know, you can try those plants in an area that has 66% uh, 
impervious surface. If you have a plant that seems to be more uh, sensitive than red maple, you may want to have a lower percentage that you calculate and, and use that. Um, but this is a, an interesting way, I think, to, to really give people guidelines for what to plant. So I'm hoping that in the future they're going to come up with these thresholds uh, for other types of plants because I think it's really useful and for them this was really um, directed toward urban forestry and and landscape people so um, again this came out of North Carolina State um, and it's something that we can explore further with different plants here in Tennessee okay so that's mostly about site selection and and proper tree selection uh, the imidacloprid work that um, Dr. came out of Dr. Oliver's lab and we've been working on for several years. Um, the only thing I want you guys to focus on is the bottom right hand side where that blue square is. Um, and this is an imidacloprid uh, drench treatment. Um, and that black line at the bottom, um, all that's showing you is that uh, 0.68 fluid ounces per inch. Um, is the full label rate of discus for uh, treating trees. Uh, we were trying to figure out whether lower rates of imidacloprid would also be effective. Um, so you could increase the number of trees per acre you treat. And what we found is essentially that the half rate of imidacloprid is just as effective as the full rate. And it also gives you three years of protection. So um, cost savings, uh, you can reliably use the half high rate of uh, these products and get the, the protection you want. Um, and I'm gonna show you another link to the extension pub uh, right here. So um, I'll ask Amy to copy and paste this into the, uh, the chat as well. So um, there is an extension pub that has tables. So you don't even have to really calculate how much you're applying. Um, it gives you the calculations. The only thing you have to measure is the diameter of the tree. Now this um, particular pub is focused on nursery um but it has sizes of trees that would also be relevant to landscape plantings um, it's just not going to have uh, rates for very large trees um, because it's really focusing on i think those smaller diameter trees so um, if this is a, a method you would like to use that's a great resource it'll give you and it actually i think it even has different products so it has some uh they actually went through and looked at the labels for different products um, and figured out the rates for those different products. If a product is not listed, um, then you're going to need to look at their label and see uh, what the percentage is of AI is in that formulation um, and do some calculations yourself. And if you would like help, um, feel free to contact me. Uh, or Dr. Oliver, and we will be happy to help you out. So are there any other control methods? Um, we've been doing research over the last few years, uh, and we just got a grant, uh, this multi-state grant, to look at flathead borers across the country in different systems. So we're looking at nursery, we're looking at landscape, we're looking at tree nuts and pecans and hazelnuts, uh, walnuts, um, and uh, trying to find as many different ways to control this pest as we can for different industries. Uh, one of the things we've been looking at for the last couple of years was cover crops. And at least in, in nursery, we found that um, basically using a cover crop is just as good as using herbicide and insecticide. So you can protect your, your trees by growing cover crop in the tree row. Um, this is kind of uh, counter to what we've been doing for many years, which is recommending herbicide in the tree row in order to keep those tree rows clean. Um, now, 
based on our work, you will get a loss in growth um, due to competition if you're not using irrigation. Um, and so we've been working on uh, the last couple of years on some management techniques to, to mitigate uh, growth loss due to cover crop. But these are winter cover crops that are put in uh, in the fall, um, transplanting your plants into those cover crops. And then those cover crops are basically acting as a barrier. Um, and we're still kind of working out why it works, whether it's just the presence of plants at the base, whether it's, um, it's shading the tree. And I, I did mention that these beetles love to lay eggs on the sunny side of the tree. Well, if this, the trunk is shaded, they're gonna go somewhere else. Um, and then the, the winter cover crop can either be killed back or die naturally during the, win, uh, the summer and provide mulch. Um, and so it's, it's a different type of method uh, for controlling these if you don't want to go out there and apply insecticide to every single one of your plants. Um, as a, a concept for landscaping, we're going to be doing some trials and, you know, if anybody out there is, uh, would like to participate in them who's involved in, in landscaping, uh, looking at irrigation, um, a lot of our nurseries do not irrigate uh, newly transplanted trees, but some of them do. And so we think that that may actually help mitigate both flathead borer damage and improve um, competition growth with, if someone is going to adopt a cover crop option. Um, in landscape, we also are considering testing, uh, trialing companion plantings with uh, susceptible trees. Uh, to see if it's possible to put something like, you know, Liriope or, or something that is attractive at the base of a tree, but will also um, protect it from future borer damage. And, you know, again, you sell it as a unit. And so it, um, it's a, uh, an additional uh, option for people who are designing landscapes. So we're going to be doing some research on that as well. Um, so just to sum up, uh, you know, choose the best plants for the region and choose a, an appropriate planting location and you're going to want to protect newly transplanted trees, whether that's in nursery or landscape. Um, right now, our main uh, protection is uh, insecticide. We're working on some other type of barrier products and contact sprays and we'll be working on that for the next four years. Um, now that we have funding for that. Um, so before we take questions, I'd like to thank everybody who's ever worked with me on any of these things. Um, and if you'd like to participate in any of our research, uh, we do uh, like to collaborate on farms or on landscapes with, um, with people who are doing the actual work so that um, we do it right and do it the way you would do it. Um, and so if you want to contact me, my phone number, my office number is there, and my email. And I see that there's questions, so I'm going to try to, I can't see the questions until I back out, so I'm going to, uh, let's see. There we go. Okay. Lee, we need this for more tree species. Yes, we absolutely do. I, I know that, um, and for different regions, it would be nice if we did it for Tennessee. Um, I know that uh, Cliff Sadoff up at Purdue has a student who's going to be working on evergreen trees, um, I think, uh, trying to come up with some calculations for like a couple of popular tree species up in that area, linden trees, I think, also. Um, and it would be great if other people um, started looking at this. The, the key issue is it really takes finding an area that has, you know, picking a tree, so say red bud, and going out and finding every red bud at a parking lot in, you know, McMinnville, Murfreesboro, Cookville, um, the whole Middle Tennessee area, Chattanooga and Nashville, and seeing if we can find an average of where the redbuds look really awesome. 
and where they look less great um, and where they're dying. And so then you can get sort of a spectrum. Um, unfortunately, that's not my area. Um, I'm, I'm very, I touch the edge of landscape. Um, I need a student to work on that. So um, maybe if you have a, a student who's graduating from uh, college and would like to do a research project, uh, send them my way. Are there any other questions? I see. Do, do, do. Um, Amy will send the uh, the information from uh, this uh, the the links I sent. And if you would like these slides, I'm happy to share them with you. Okay. All right, guys. Any other questions? I was going to check and see our sponsor is on today and she may not be at her desk, but I was going to say <laughs> Mindy Money uh, with BASF has sponsored these meetings and as you guys know, there are four different meetings, all of which you can get pesticide points if you need. Uh, a few of you guys, I'm not sure if you're watching together. If so, please send me a list of who is watching. Uh, I know that Lee had mentioned some of the guys up at UT wanted to view together, which is totally fine. Always, I just need to make sure I know who's together and who's not. Um, the other thing I would like to say, uh, again, I apologize that my video is not working. I don't know what's going on. Um, we, uh, thanks to Mindy, we do have our next session will be this Friday, actually, and we're going to have Katie Kilborn with the Department of Agriculture. Uh, she's the state plant pathologist. She's going to discuss some of the insects and pathogens that are here or that we need to be aware of. Um, I was speaking with her this morning and she had some really, some interesting stuff to say about what she's including. Uh, the other kind of cool thing is we've also been able to include um, Ryan Walker and Chad Haynes from the Department of Agriculture. They are the drift specialists. So they just wanna make sure that everyone knows that they're available. They've been seeing a lot more pesticide drift and it's not just for nursery, but if there's some problems in landscape, et cetera, they are here to help you guys. So I thought that would be a nice addition um, really cool fellas, but I think that you all will enjoy it if you attend. Uh, our last program on the 31st is going to be a real bonus. It's Suzanne Wainwright. She is a biological and beneficial insect specialist. She's called the bug lady, and she is a consultant out of Pennsylvania. So she's wonderful. She's, she's going to be... Nice. She's going to be a real treat, um, and what she's going to be talking about can also apply in the landscape. So we hope to see everyone there. I saw there was one more chat question. Um, points will be automatically assigned. I'll be sending in a list. That was a question to ask about pesticide points. Uh, I've got a list of everyone. I'm just trying to figure out who a few of these are. Like I said, I've got one person that I need an email from if you need points, B-E-O-5-D-B-E. -E. And then also Karsten Maggi, I don't believe I have any information for you. So just shoot me an email if you need points and you're here, either of you guys right here. Um, and then I'd say that's about it. Uh, after I get the point list together, I'll go ahead and submit it to the state and they'll automatically assign. Any other questions? If anybody has any questions that pop up later, um, feel free to, to email me. That's probably the better way to get in touch with me right now because uh, we're still partly working from home. Um, so my office phone may not be answered, but uh, I'll always answer email, so. Okay, one more quick. Mindy is here, so I wanted her to say something if she'd like to. Mindy, unmute yourself. She may not be able to if you muted her from the control. Oh, let me do that. Let's see.
Um, it's not allowing me to do anything. Okay, well, Mindy's here, but we can't talk to her. Um, anyways, Mindy Money with BASF, she is a chemical rep. She covers much of most of Tennessee and several other states. She's out of North Carolina. She'll be joining us for the next several sessions. So uh, please, if you have any questions, she's a great resource and I'm sure she'd like to talk to some of you guys. Okay, that's gonna be it then, I guess. Thank you all very much. Thank you for listening. All right. <laughs>